So good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here today. Um, I truly, truly appreciate it. You know, it's always humbling to me every time I turn on the computer and, and on a Saturday morning see anybody um, here. At, um, it's always humbling uh, on that measure for me because it just seems like <laughs> got to be better things to do on a Saturday morning than listen to me. <laughs> but I truly, truly appreciate it. So what I wanted to talk about is um, ways that we can kind of identify um, institutional activity in a stock or in the market and how we might be able to take advantage of that. Now, we talked a little bit um, a week ago about um, the idea of how balance of power can help you and time segmented volume. Now, both of those are institution, or I mean, proprietary indicators of uh, Warden Brothers. And they were actually created by uh, uh, Don Warden. He was actually awarded, um, he, he was quite a technician, and he was actually awarded a, um, Well, it's it's basically a CMT um, market um, um, certified market technician, um, but he was awarded back in the day when it was brand new. And to be awarded back in that day, you had to significantly advance the um, art of technical analysis. And he was quite a guy. Um, put these things together and um, found some new ways to really take a look at the market in in kind of a different, well, a, a, in a different light. And what he was really doing is he was looking for institutional activity in a stock. And the first one I want to talk about here today is time segmented volume. Now, TSV, you can do a lot of different things with TSV. As you can see, I've got a TSV inside a um, Bollinger Band, a 10-8 Bollinger Band. But let me explain TSV here. Let's get rid of that. Just remove that altogether. Time save negative volume is is a method where Don Warden tried to put together where he could he could kind of compare price and volume at the same time in segmented periods of time, and in doing that, found that it was it was much better than just straight money stream because it involved a little bit of the price action as well. And he could identify those periods when money was flowing toward um, or into a stock or flowing out of a stock. Now, time segment of volume is plotted around a zero line. So there's a zero line here, as you can see. And that zero line, any time TSV crossed above the zero line, it was telling, um, it tells us that money is flowing into the stock. If we are below, it's usually a distribution phase where f money is flowing out of the stock. And so it was a method of trying to identify where those institutions that were the big money, where the big money was going. And if we can identify that, then we can have just a small tactical advantage um, in the market, if we can see those fingerprints of where they are, where they're moving around, how they might be shifting and adjusting in the market. Now, TSV can be done in a lot of different ways. You'll see a lot of times you they will plot TSV around a moving average. Oops. So if we right click on there and say add a plot, and if I put a moving average, let's say we put a moving average um, um, exponential on here and we do something like a, uh, 21 moving average. 
you can use uh, you'll see it used in all different ways heck you can use a shorter term if you want but the the idea around plotting it around a moving average is we can actually see on that moving average when we when we've crossed up and we get that um indication that money is has changed it's changing it's it's growing it's gaining um, energy and strength so you can see that begin right in here on this chart using that moving average where we really picked up in here held and then really started to surge in that money up into the chart now what's interesting is you can also see in this indicator just like a lot of indicators you can see convergence and divergence um, in the in that indicator so you can see that right up here our price is staying really really strong but notice that we are sinking here a little bit now that can be nothing more than a consolidation and you can see that right in here you don't want to read too much into it you can see right in here where we sank below that moving average we remained above the zero line and really what we all we really did was consolidate in here so it's just a little resting period in that stock and what we want to see we want to see that starting to pick back up if this is going to hold a consolidation to move higher what we don't want to see is that time segmented volume continuing to decline dropping below that zero line and see price up here that would give us a clue of a potential failure coming into play now I put a 21 on there I think when you pull this right out of the box here on TC 2000 it's going to default to a 19 okay you can you can literally plot it against virtually any kind of moving average that you want what I have found is when I smooth that out just a little bit more I get a little bit uh, better signals so for example if I were to use a 34 on that notice I get a little bit more of a smoothed out effect and it it actually does a little bit better job of matching the zero line here time segmented volume Ellie time segmented volume <coughs> so the purpose here the purpose here is to find a a, um, a a calculation that gives you that simple clue now you can see i've got this in here as a tsv 12. don warden wrote this indicator and his his idea was um if you were a real short-term trader okay you would use a TSV somewhere between 9 and 12 if you're an enemy intermediate trader you might use something between 18 and 25 TSV and if you're a long-term trader um, 35 to 45 for that long-term trader now all it does is it really it, it by going more time it kind of smooths out it it removes all of the the messiness so you can see if i change this to a shorter time frame let's go to an eight which is just a little bit less than what uh, don warden even suggested notice that the indicator really loses some of its um I hate to say predictive power but it really kind of does lose some of its predictive power okay because there's too much noise in it it's it's whipping up and down whipping up and down and it's not really giving us a whole lot of good clues other than we're relatively staying above this 34 EMA and we're staying above the zero line so that's that's all that's really telling us here it's not giving us anything very substantial if you go to one of the longer terms let's say you go to the 18 TSV notice that it smooths that out considerably and it really starts coming into focus a little bit better right where we cross over and we start this rally in the chart okay so it's one of those indicators that even if you're a shorter term trader 
swing trader, it's oftentimes better to look at it with a little bit longer period to smooth it out uh, just enough to give you better quality data in the chart. So you can play around with this, but you can see on this chart, um, when we get these crosses in here and we get these moves that hold above the zero line, we actually get those moves that come up. When we sell off, you, we can see that in here pretty clearly. When we break down and then drop below that zero line, there's that shorting pattern that comes into play on the chart. Now you can certainly utilize this with any other strategy. So for example, if you wanted to utilize this with the 3-8 strategy, it may help you if you're looking for some of that confirmation that money is flowing into a stock or flowing out of a stock. Okay. If, if you run into a stock that is extremely volatile, I found that uh, TSV can just really be a mess. Um, because that we get all that volume swinging in and out of a trade. For example, if you use something too short a time frame like Peloton, well, the way I have this set up, you can see it's it's useless. It doesn't tell us anything unless we switch over to like an hourly chart. Then it starts to give me some clues to the price action. Okay, so you have to be really thoughtful about how you use TSV and its purpose. Its purpose is to help you identify when institutions, big players, are moving in and out of a stock. Now, it I, I will tell you that it can be useful in indexes, but can, it can also be a bit confusing. Okay, because you can see how quickly we fall here in these um, indexes and then rally back up. But we do get a nice clue. Can you guys see we get this nice clue in here where we crossed over? Just a second. Drawing tools changed on me here. We get this nice crossover here and then notice that we hold right in this consolidation up in here and then we start to expand out price so it can be helpful but remember anytime you use an indicator it's only as good as the person who's reading it okay and your consistency with what how you read it so you have to be very very thoughtful when you think about adding an indicator like this but time segment minute volume it was truly designed to help you find that that move, that institutional move that may be sliding in and out of a trade, um, giving you um, good quality clues to the potential moves that are being created here. So here again, um, here's Valero. Valero has never broken this trend in here, but notice when it consolidated, that period of volume dropped. It even dropped below the zero line. So a bit of a contradiction there, right? A contradiction. You have to utilize your technical skills and price action in combination with TSV. You cannot just rely on TSV as saying, this is the trade, this is not the trade. Okay, does that make sense? So you go through a longer period of consolidation and we drop below. But that doesn't change that um, Valero could be setting up here for an upside move. What we need is we need that confirmation of those buyers stepping in, pushing that through, and then we'll see that turning back up. The positive sign that we have in here, even though we've got a crossover of that moving average, is that we're still holding above our zero line, and overall we're relatively rising indicator. Okay, so you can see an indicator like this or any indicator has a lot of subjectiveness to it. You have to be thoughtful about how you approach that. 
Do you guys have any questions on that? TSV takes some time to, to use and be effective at reading. Now, one of the things I used to do is I used to plot TSV against rate of change. Well, not necessarily, Barry. Um, remember, what this is trying to do is tell you if there's, if there's accumulation or distribution. Okay, so I wouldn't I wouldn't phrase it quite that way, but we could you know for example we can see over here where we broke down we're down below the zero line and we rally back. Notice that if I put a cursor right across there, TSV did not indicate that volume was really coming back into that stock. That place where you might get trapped. We've all done that, right? Where we've kind of gotten trapped right in here. Oh my gosh, it's it's bouncing back up. We fail to see the price resistance in the chart. But TSV here wasn't fooled. Okay, it just it wasn't fooled at all. And then on down it goes in that indicator. So you can find Convergences, you can find divergences. Okay. And you really have to incorporate. It's one of the things that I really hesitate on bringing up indicators like this because if you don't use the indicator with the right attitude, if you use the indicator as this is the buy sell indicator, it's you're done. I, I mean, this is going to mess you up like you can't believe. Um, I'm going to say this, and I may repeat this several times today. There's no indicator. There's no indicator that's a buy-sell entry signal. Zero. Indicators are always late. They're always lagging. The only way this indicator can be calculated is if the information has already come through the market. Okay. So think about that. <clears throat> yeah, there's there's so many different ways, Ed. You're right, Martha uses a 1224 on her TSV. And and you know, I can I can change that here. And, and you saw I had it set up as a 12 originally, but the 12 gives you a lot more back and forth choppiness in the chart. What I was trying to do is help show that if you smooth that out a little more. Um, it's easier for people to read. So there's a 1224, and you can see with the, with the settings I had before, it was a little bit smoother. It was a little easier to read what was going on there. Would you agree? It gave you probably more useful confirmation information. All indicators differ from other indicators, Richard. They're different calculations. So yes, I mean, they're gonna be a different calculation. It may be something similar. The Conklin money flow is gonna be, is going to be using money flow to try and do it when this is truly using price and volume data for the calculation. Okay. Yeah, we can reverse, uh, sir. Use a 24 and a 12. Absolutely. So what we're looking for, again, is we're just looking, TSV is not a buy-sell indicator. It's a confirmation of what you're seeing in price. 
Is price productive, bullish? Is there accumulation? Is price bearish? Is there distribution? Remember, this period right here, where we're rallying up, the place where so many people want to chase into the trade. TSV is telling us we're not above the zero line. There's not good accumulation going on in that chart yet. If you use TSV as a crossing indicator, just plan to lose a lot of money. Seriously, it will, it will tear your account to pieces. TSV needs to be used in combination with price. What is price doing? What is trend doing? When do things start looking productive? So for example, the, what I always show in here, break of the downtrend, hold it as support. Notice that right in that period right in here is where TSV actually starts to cross over and shows productiveness in the chart. How about the bigger trend downtrend? We have this bigger downtrend. We cross over. We hold it as support. It's in this period where we've actually crossed over our zero line, showing some productiveness in the chart. But notice it's not TSV that tells us there's a signal here. It's the price action. The price action gives us the signal for the trade. TSV just confirms that there's volume coming into that trade. Does that make sense? Now, the way I had this set up before with an 18, let me just show you this again. If I go to an 18 here and I make this a 34, I can get a little bit more in that confirmation type indicator than you can in the short term. Okay. What, um, point out the divergence that you're talking about. I mean, a divergence is nothing more, okay. Um, price is going one direction. The indicator's going another direction. <clears throat> that's a divergence a convergence is when <clears throat> price is moving up and the indicator is moving up they're converging they're coming together <clears throat> so it's accumulation and distribution is all we're looking at is there a net amount of buying or net amount of selling is that making some sense guys Well, Ed, there's really not really much of a divergence there. Just like I pointed out right here, this consolidation period, volume shrinks during a consolidation, right? It has to. So the indicator moves down. Same thing happened here. This was largely just chop and consolidation. And so the indicator moves down. Okay, it's just, think about it logically. If, if we're in consolidation, is volume flowing into that stock? Normally not. And if volume is flowing into the stock, it's another, in, um, there's a balance of power is what we're gonna talk about next. Balance of power may give you that clue that they are mucking around with it where they're shorting the stock during this period while they're trying to buy it up during this period and they're holding it in a range. TSV is not gonna help you there because they're equal in the short and long. So we're gonna be flatlined on TSV.
you know, if, if you stop and just think about this logically, what does volume tell us? Volume bars on its own are almost useless. Okay, if we go back over here to a, a standard, our, our chart here, and look at volume bars, notice that during, during the entire rally here, volume has been weak. Volume bars tell us almost nothing. It's really good at telling us exhaustion. When we get an exhaustive move right here and we get that super high candle, we've exhausted the move. Yeah, it's, it's almost useless. <clears throat> well, Tim, I would say that used to be true. Okay, but it's, it's not indicative of the truth today. All you have to do to see that is go to a diamonds chart or any, any chart, really. Go into a short-term chart and notice that every day at the end of the day, we have a volume spike. Every day at the end of the day, we have a volume spike. That volume spike is the dark pool activity being consolidated to the market. They were able to trade all day long and we can't see it. So if we can't see it right until the end of the day, the last 10 minutes of the day, what good is volume to us? And that's where institutions are doing a great deal of their trading now. Used to use on balance volume. I, I again with all of these, um, I don't use a lot of. Um, you guys know I just don't use indicators anymore because everything I need to know is really in the price action of the chart. But the reason I showed this is because if you are searching for some of those clues, you know, Alan, I agree. I, to me, it should be illegal, and if I was if I was ahead of the F SEC, it would be illegal tomorrow. Because we don't have a fair market. Because institutions are allowed to trade privately and that volume is not consolidated to the market until the end of the day. And every single day we get that volume spike right at the end of the day, which means that all the data throughout the day was really worthless meant nothing, right? It had no usefulness to us whatsoever. Because we can't see it. <clears throat> okay. Well, GW, you can see, no, according to the rules of the dark pools, they're not supposed to move the price of the chart, okay? That's what they claim, that they don't move the price. But you tell me this, if an institution is buying large quantities of stock, is that going to put pressure on the price? I mean, think about it. If stock is being traded back and forth, is price going to be affected by that? Now they claim that they don't affect price, but that's just hogwash. You can't move product back and forth and not have a price influence. Okay. 
that's all there is to it. Now, they're, again, their claim and what, the, what they've sold the SEC on is that they don't move price. Well, why is it at the end of the day, we can have an absolutely dead day in the market and then see a surge and a big spike in price right at the end of the day, whether it be up or down. They did move the market. Okay. There is no advantage to buy at the end of the day that I know of. See, what's happening here, and that's why I hate going into these discussions about price. What's happening here is all of a sudden, everybody's getting all wound up about trying to reach out for that golden ring. Well, is there just a little micro clue that I can use to make money in the market? There has to be some perfect little indicator, perfect little clue out there. Guys, the clue, the golden ring, the holy grail is price. We have to watch and read the price action of the chart. Indicators are only there to provide us clues confirmation okay the price action they're not there they were never intended they cannot do it no matter how many times you go to a um a seminar or a webinar that says oh you got to have this indicator this indicator is the band this is all you have to do is spend a little time studying how indicators are calculated, and you're going to find out there's nothing different under the sun. They're all calculated with the same three inputs, price action, volume, and time. Okay. We have a distinct disadvantage because of dark pull activity. But that's nothing new. We have a distinct disadvantage from institutions that are trading trillions of dollars. We have to get out of this idea that we can create some micro indicator or something that's going to give us the winning trade every time. Anytime you begin the conversation of indicators, it always descends into this conversation. Okay, if we read price action and follow price action, can we see possibilities right here where the stock breaks out broke its downtrend rallied up strongly we had confirmation of volume coming in during this consolidation volume is pulled back but we're still holding positive we're still holding way above the zero line if this pops out here isn't that something we want to know price is the indicator to get you into the trade. Supporting indicators are there to help give you confidence or help you see some of that activity in there. That's correct. Indicators look at the past. They have to look at the past. It's the only thing they can be calculated on. Okay. So that's TSV. Now there's another way to look at TSV, and I'm going to remove this moving average. Whoops. And I'm going to put TSV, whoops, 
I'm going to put TSV inside of a Bollinger Band. Ten period. Point eight standard deviation. Okay. <clears throat> Bollinger bands <clears throat> have their own mystique as they are. They're um, people like to th uh, believe that Bollinger bands give them everything that they need to to trade that it gives them the great signals and i spent years on this and literally guys years i spent years trying to um create the perfect bollinger band that would give me trades that were productive okay but i can tell you this very uh, without any completely confident that there's no such thing again any indicator is only as good as the person reading it and if you over focus on the indicator over price you're making a major major mistake okay a fellow by the name of David Elliott <clears throat> was one of the best technicians that you're gonna find ever. He was pretty brilliant when it comes to um, really pushing indicators to their, to their extreme. No one had ever heard of the idea of doing a Bollinger Band with a 0.8 standard deviation. Now he used that, he called it Mobo Bands. I actually helped program the Mobo Bands that are in the Thinkorswim platform okay but the mobile bands are really nothing more than a Bollinger band with a tight standard deviation now what we found when we were messing around with this stuff and that's really what playing with indicators is all about you just you just keep messing with them you keep trying to pull something out of them that that no one else has seen and he dropped a TSV inside and wrapped a, a Bollinger Band around it, a 10-8 standard deviation Bollinger Band. Now notice what this shows us. The 10-8 Bollinger Band, when we cross out of the 10-8 Bollinger Band, we have positive accumulation going on. Okay, it's easy to read. It's one of the reasons I thought this was brilliant. It's easy to read when we break down through the Bollinger Bands that we're in a bearish move, and easy to read when we break above the B Bollinger Bands that we're in a bullish mood. Okay, so putting your TSV, and by the way, I'm still running that 18, that little bit longer. If I smooth this out even more, if I made this a 24, you can see that that actually cleans this up even more and gives maybe give us a little bit more useful data in being able to see that there is accumulation. And by the way, that's all this indicator is. It's not a crossover indicator. It's nothing more. Don't buy based on an, an indicator. Buy based on the price action. So you can see if I move down through some stocks, let's look at Mo here. Mo picked up. Notice we have nothing in here showing yet. Why don't we have anything showing in here yet? It can't catch up that fast. Okay, we have a good buy signal. It cannot catch up that fast. We're using a 24 TSV. Now, if I were to use something like a 12 TSV, it might catch up a little bit sooner. See there? It's trying to pick up that change in volume. Okay, but if we want to use it for that trending indicator, if we do that longer period on here, we get more of that trending indicator. 
that shows us something has changed. Is that making sense, guys? Yeah, Tim, that it has to, yeah, they're lagging. They have to lag. So you can choose if you want the real short term, the real short term TSV. And, and by the by the way, the shortest TSV that the Don Warden ever suggested was a nine. But to me, when I shorten it up that much, how much useful data is there in that? How much could, do you guys see that you could interpret that about 19 different ways? Pretty hard to use that indicator, right? No, TOS does not have TSV. <clears throat> Again, it's a proprietary indicator of Warden Brothers. Now, that doesn't mean that somebody hasn't figured out how to calculate it. So for me, going too short a time frame is not useful. If I go to a longer term time frame, it can be useful in helping me identify. You know, if we were to look at Microsoft, okay, over this long consolidation, notice that it buried itself inside, telling us there's this consolidation going on. But then we started to break through. Volume started coming in to the chart. We started moving higher. If I take this to a weekly, it's going to work exactly the same way. Accumulation, distribution. Notice that we've got that accumulation beginning here. So keep in mind, however you choose to use these, you have to be very, very careful not to over-focus on the indicator and focus on the price action of the chart. Okay? It can be an aid, it can be a massive, massive distraction if you don't, oops, if you don't pay attention to price. It will mess you up like you can't believe. Well, you know, Alan, there's always those folks out there that want that technical look. And again, <clears throat> it comes down to your skill of reading it. <clears throat> so what I'm, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> excuse me. So what I wanna say is if you decide to use TSV, you need to practice, and I mean practice a lot. You need to look at a lot of charts. You need to go back and forth in those charts. You need to look at what that chart is telling you. If it's giving you any useful data, useful information, that makes some sense. Are we really seeing accumulation? And remember, that's all this is. Accumulation, distribution, accumulation, distribution, accumulation, distribution. And then you have to think about the time frame. Notice this 24 TSV really isn't telling us a whole lot right here on this great big move. But if I were to change that to the shorter term, say a 12, now it's showing us something. So you have to make a decision. Okay. You have to make a decision and decide what how do you want to use the indicator? What gives you the most useful information? Okay. Go 
Google. There's you, there's the 12. That's really not showing us much. If I go longer term, it shows us a little bit more. Okay. So you have to really work those time frames, work that price pattern, make that decision, what works the best for you. Okay? Time segmented volume. Um, if there was an indicator to help you identify, um, I, I think it's I think it's far superior. This is my opinion. I think it's far superior to money flow. I think it's far superior to Conklin money flow. I think it's far superior to um, to uh, almost all of those moving average or I mean um, volume type indicators because it actually incorporates price and volume into the indicator calculation. Okay, over segmented periods of time, it's looking for accumulation or distribution. Okay, now that's my opinion. Now, even with my opinion, you notice I don't keep it on my charts. Okay. How about balance of power? Balance of power is also a proprietary indicator of Warden Brothers. And this is this is the indicator that Don Warden actually won his market technician's um, status as, uh, as advancing the field of technical analysis. Okay. Balance of power, how he used it, was using it as a histogram. <clears throat> Okay, if we look at a stock, let's see if we can find something here. <clears throat> the histogram is based around a zero line. Whoops. Based around a zero line. Cannot seem to get that to draw for some reason. There we go. <clears throat> Anything above the zero line is positive anything below the zero line is negative okay <clears throat> there are three different colors that he used in the indicator green when it turns green all that simply means is it crossed above 30. <clears throat> you can see that it's plotted as 100 and minus 100. okay Anything that's green means that it's crossed above 30. It's turning bullish. Okay, There's accumulation. Now, what it's meant to do is track systematic buying. Dominant buying. Okay? Now, a balance of power is only useful to me in really one circumstance. When I see a stock consolidating or even pulling back and I see strong balance of power in the stock, that's one of those fingerprints of an institution or a high frequency trading firm. Okay, the only way there can be accumulation and notice um, here, let me pull this up a little bit further. This will this will really mess you up. If you notice in here, we've had rising TSV. So we've got rising TSV, time segmented volume coming in, and we have balance of power showing systematic buying going on. Now it's only crossed over green a few times. I usually like to see nice high and tight green indicators in there for balance of power. 
I typically only am concerned about balance of power when we are in a consolidation or when we're in a pullback. Now remember, even if we're in a pullback, I want to see a trend. So no matter what, we need a stock that's trending, something that's moving up positively or moving down in a trend. And then I want to see that period where we get that resting in here. We get that accumulation that's happening. It's registering in TSV. It's also registering in balance of power. Balance of power is indicating that there could be, not that there has to be, that there could be high frequency trading firm or an institution that's building a position in Honeywell. Okay. Now, why would that be the case? Well, when an institution buys into a stock, remember, we're talking about companies that'll put 30, 40, 50 million dollars into a single stock. Okay, when may they make a decision like that, they make a decision as we want to buy this stock between this price and this price. They don't just continuously buy the stock. They have to build their position. Balance of power, according to Don Warden, was meant to help you identify when systematic buying and selling is occurring. Okay? It really is nothing more than an oscillator, but it's, it's applied on a histogram to give you a little bit better information. Okay? No, also selling, Richard. Buying or selling, systematically. If it turns red, there's systematic distribution going on. Large lot distribution going on. Okay. So in here, we're looking for this next move. Notice that I don't, I don't anticipate this move. What I'm doing more than anything is I'm identifying the price pattern itself, the price action. The price action is my trade. The indicator is giving me a clue that there may be pressure building on this to pop because there's accumulation going on in the stock. Okay. Um, yellow, by the way, uh, Bob, keep in mind, if it's yellow, only yellow, that's neutral. Now, I always prefer to see it moving with the direction of the market. So, Bob, you are correct here in the, in the sense that we have a convert or divergence here in price and, and Bob, right? We have a divergence. But we have that nice move going up in the chart. Now, I didn't try or even attempt to buy anything in Honeywell in here, and you guys know why. I'm not interested until it breaks the downtrend and proves support. So my nearest opportunity would have been right in here, and it was such a quick move, I wouldn't have caught it. It would be rare that I would catch that. too quick okay but when I get these consolidating moves like this that bullish consolidation and the reason I say bullish consolidation is because we're in a trend we're in a trend we've broken through major resistance in the chart we're at all-time highs 
and yet I see accumulation going into this stock at this at this all-time high accumulation flying thank you, flying into this stock and the stock is going nowhere that's when I like to watch it when I'm basically not getting any price move but pressure is building on the stock so I'm watching for an alert for that to pop through. That pop through gives me that clue and gives me confidence in taking that trade because of the accumulation. If you use the two in combination, I wouldn't, this is not, this isn't momentum, Barry. I wouldn't call that momentum. Consolidation is not momentum. What it's showing is pressure. See, a stock cannot be in a narrow range forever, right? If a stock stays in a narrow range for too long, what happens? Sellers come in because there's an opportunity loss here, right? There's an opportunity loss. They can't have their money just stagnant. They want it making money. And if it stays stagnant for too long, they bail on it. Okay. Now here's the cool thing for us as option traders. What happens to implied volatility during this period right here? Yeah, implied volatility shrinks, meaning that the option prices get cheaper. So if we can catch this move in here, catch that buy, and all of a sudden implied volatility expands, we not only get the price move, but we get the implied volatility spike as well. One of the reasons I love this pattern so much, and I'm one of the few people, I've, I've trained on this several times, folks in the room, but I'm just one of the few people that, that use it. And it's because I've spent so many years um, using it and looking at it, it gives me some good quality information in a trade. But let's, let's be um, very real on this. AXP is not showing anything. Does that mean that this can't move up? No, that's right, Barry. It can move up. It may not it may not just be that major activity center in in the stock because we can take a look at stocks like AMD and show you there we had a big spiking move and BOP was not existent. We had little teeny tiny bullish clues. TSV was indicating accumulation, but BOP wasn't registering anything in there to give us a clue. So what does that mean? Once again, it means price is the most important thing to focus on. Something like BOP that's right, price is king. Something like Bob can give us clues of something going on. And if the pattern is right and the trend is right, we can take advantage of that. So for example, um, I run against my list, I have a balance of power greater than 30. Although it turns green at 30. So I can just sort my list by that, balance of power greater than 30. And you can see we've got WBA here. WBA. <clears throat> Does anybody like the fact that WBA is going flat sideways? TSV is showing a strength. And balance of power is registering strong buying going on. In WBA see I don't care if it's if it's showing me strength and the stock is already running it's too late for me but if I can catch this in here where the stock could be setting up nice tight pop out of the box consolidation possible 
strong balance of power coming in here. And what you'll find a lot of times <clears throat> is that will come in after earnings reports or something like that. They'll get analysts will upgrade it. Um, they'll put higher price targets and then you'll see those high frequency trading firms and things like that start accumulating a position here. That bigger play. Now we know WBA has been a long term downtrend. We can see the balance of power during some of these periods in here gave us clues to more selling. More distribution in the stock but it's also giving us clues of accumulation, okay? So if we watch those closely, and you can see here, I'm just gonna do this for giggles. Put TSV up here. The reason I don't do this is it messes up the price action chart. Okay. So you can see TSV is showing us accumulation and balance of power is showing us accumulation. So what I'm waiting for is that next clue that shows me we're going to pop out of here. And if I do my technical analysis on this chart, if I pull this chart back and I start looking for trends, if I start looking for support and resistance levels in the chart, then I start to build a case for this trade. And I also know that I don't have to rush here either, do I? If this is the trend we're going to follow, this is gonna consolidate for quite a bit longer still. It's possible, however, that it's going to follow this trend. So what we have to do as a trader is place a price alert on this chart, wait for the chart so we prepare ahead of time. And that's one of the reasons I love balance of power is balance of power gives me that clue ahead of time to keep an eye on it. Okay. FDX. FDX is showing us BOP accumulation. All right, but here's a problem. If I pull this chart back and do the technical analysis on this chart, what do we have going on here? Rejection at the trend, downtrend. The little short-term uptrend we had, we have failed. Okay, so for me, there's no trade here yet. I don't have a technically correct pattern. So I can have balance of power and still have no trade until the price action is correct. So if this moves itself on back up, holds that higher low, balance of power continues to hold in here, I've got a trade. But until that occurs, balance of power doesn't give me anything to trade around, okay? Because the pattern itself is more important. It could fail. Just like any other indicator, balance of power fails from time to time. BOP does not work very well for indexes at all, Robert. And the reason is it takes, it, as a matter of fact, if, you, if we take a look at something like Microsoft or, or a really big stock, Balance of power rarely indicates much of anything. Okay, because there's so much volume flowing in and out of these stocks, it's very, very difficult for balance of power to register much of anything. Okay, now if you go to a shorter term, so for example, if I go to an hourly, 
notice I get more activity in that shorter term because in that hourly we can we there's shorter um, smaller time frames that we're calculating that on. TSV will work for large caps. Um, yeah, definitely. Well, you can you can see it here if I go back to the daily. TSV crossing above its Bollinger, staying bullish, staying above the zero line. So yeah, TSV is registering strength in there. Where balance of power is not showing systematic accumulation. Okay, remember, there's a difference here. This is measuring price and volume. This is trying to make balance of power is trying to measure systematic accumulation or distribution. Okay, so when we look at typically, if we look at smaller stocks, um, <clears throat> we're going to find a better opportunity in balance of power. Okay. Stocks that give us, um, oops, clear that. Stocks that start to indicate a little bit more buying occurring. More of accumulation periods. See how we had that accumulation period right in here? And then we finally expand out. Now, how does, why does that work? <clears throat> Again, institutions, when they're buying high-frequency trading firms, Jim Cramer got himself into some trouble talking about this. One time he started shooting off his mouth and the SEC kind of come down on him hard. What he was doing is essentially bragging that when he, when he ran his fund, he could manipulate stocks. And he even said it was really gratifying to do it. And he said it would only take 10 or $20 million to make that happen. So if he's wanting to buy something, if an institution's wanting to buy something, they can manipulate the price by buying and selling it at the same time. Now, um, if you go to like, um, if you go to like mutual funds, mutual funds don't short. So mutual funds are normally not, even though there's gazillions of dollars in mutual funds, they're not in that same same realm as the big institutions, high frequency trading firms and things like that. The, the mutual funds, uh, because of the rules for mutual funds, aren't able to do some of the things that the institutions do. So the institutions, if they decide they want to buy up SLF, put 20, 30 million dollars into the stock, they're going to, as they buy it, they're going to short it. So they're going to short an equal amount that they're buying. And this is trying to identify that occurring. Okay. It's trying to identify that, man, at the top of every hour, a thousand shares of SLF get purchased. Because when an institution buys, it's not somebody sitting at his computer saying, Oh yeah, it's 12 o'clock, I gotta buy another thousand shares. No, they just set up their computer every hour on the hour and the computer is very accurate, obviously. It's going to buy up a thousand shares as long as it's between prices between this price and this price. Okay. Once their position has been accumulated, they start to release their short position and the stock begins to rise. Okay, and they have to do that. If you think about this logically, they literally have to do it that way. Because if they came in and bought $20 million of SLF and SLF gaps up here, everybody that owns SLF sells it and they lose money. They really have no choice but to do it that way to kind of sneak in. Anybody ever heard of a guy by the name of Phil Town? Phil Town was, um, he's a, he's a long-term, long-term holder, investor. Um, he did a lot of work with um, a company called Invest Tools, 
where they were using you know arrows green arrows and red hour arrows and stuff like that it was very expensive training um for anyone who went through their courses but essentially he does that he had this great great speech at a conference that i was at how an institution works is they're trying to sneak in you know and they pop up here and they're only there they're only visible for a little bit and then they they hide again and then they pop up again and that he was essentially describing this kind of thing where they're always popping up and down in here but they really are trying to hide their activity because if they really let their activity out then they can't make money they don't have no advantage does that make sense guys so they have to go through this process because they're trading such big numbers. Now, our job as a retail trader is to try to find those clues. Because if we can find those clues using TSV, using balance of power and price action, we can identify those fingerprints that something is going on here, that there is a movement happening here. Okay, we have advantages in being nimble, Barry, but overall we're very disadvantaged compared to the market itself. And the reason is, is because the high frequency trading firms, if it was just us and the big institutions, we'd have a pretty good advantage. But because of those high frequency trading uh, firms placing their computers right on the backbone of the market, they're actually reading money flow and reading order flow through the market. And if they can identify order flow changes, they trade against it before your trade ever makes it to the market. Okay. And that's kind of that's one of the reasons why the market is so volatile nowadays where it used to be you know back in the 80s we would get into a trend and remember anybody that traded back in that time period 80s and 90s a good day in the market as it moved 25 points that was a big day for the market yes much more orderly now it's 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 just a mess because of all of this um, high frequency trading dark pool activity all of these little mechanisms computer algorithmic trading that's always in there picking away at people's accounts so we have to be smarter we have to be more patient for the patterns the advantage that we have is we're much more nimble and if we study charts enough we can identify that fingerprint that they're coming in and if we avoid predicting Here's the cool part. If we avoid predicting, we can just follow when the institutions give us that clue. We can just tag along. Okay, we're that little tiny speck. We're like the flea on the elephant butt. Kind of a nasty description, I guess, but but that's where we are in the in the in the realm of things. We're just riding along. Okay, so if we can identify where they're going, we get an easy ride without any effort. That's the purpose of this class really, is to show you that there are places where you can find those fingerprints. But once again, the most important thing is price. Do we need, do we need TSV here or balance of power here in this chart to see that something has changed here in this chart. Do we need that? If we read price action, can we do this without any indicator? Yes, we absolutely can. We can see that there's opportunity. The purpose of these would be to say, hey, I see something going on here and I'm getting confirmation. The other purpose of these is being able to run a scan to find charts like this. And that's all this is, guys. I just ran 
against my list, I run a balance of power greater than 30 in my list. And you can see HTZ is right in there. Fitbit is in there. Momo is in there. We just identified yesterday by looking at the 3-8 trap. This is a 3-8 trap setting up. Momo breaking through, holding trend. There's something going on here. And this gives me that little bit of help that there may be some institutions coming in, high frequency trading firms building a position in here. Does that make sense? So price is king, and we can use these indicators to identify that hey, the big guys may be in here mucking around, right? It just gives us that clue. Their, their fingerprints are on it. They're, they're in here mucking around. Okay. Now I'm going to go one step further. You guys have stuck in here this long. I'm going to go just one step further here. We had talked about Elliott Wave. Now, Elliott Wave is uh, they call it Elliott wave theory it was actually developed by a guy um years and years ago back in the 1930s his name was ralph nelson he um he he had been forced into retirement because of an illness and he was looking for something to do and he started studying charts okay and he started looking at yearly monthly and weekly charts and he actually created, it wasn't available in his day. He actually self-made 30-minute charts and daily charts. They, they didn't even have them back then. It was monthly, yearly, weekly charts, okay? And he started looking at price patterns um, in this thing, and he, and he put out a, um, a, a book uh, for forecasting. And here's, here's one of the problems with it, um, is he got famous um, uh, back in the day when he came out and said that he believed the market was bottoming at one point in time, and he happened to be right. And the market rallied well back in the day there was nobody doing that kind of forecasting and so he became very very famous very quick as you know hey this guy can predict the market and that's one of the problems i have with elliott wave theory is is it's actually described okay um <laughs> in fact here's here's an, an actual excerpt okay it says rn elliott describes specific rules gov governing how to identify predict and capitalize on wave patterns okay so elliott wave was really all about predicting a shift in the market okay Uh, no, gold will work perfectly, Robert. Here, let me give you anybody that doesn't have TC2000. Guys, I, I honestly, I, I don't know why with all of the great tools and things that we show here with TC2000, why uh, folks resist. They just don't want to invest in their business. Um, if you use that coupon for the gold version, it's like, $271 for a year. Uh, and that's one trade, guys. And the tools and the ease of use. No, no, it's perfectly fine. Perfectly fine. Um, definitely worth doing. Okay. So let's get back here to um, Elliott Wave. So he was really trying to find a way to predict and he actually um got famous because he called a market bottom at one time that based on his pattern work um um that's where it was he really wasn't um much of a trader um he was more of a price action shall i say price action analyst um himself and, and you'll find some of these folks that do these kind of indicator stuff things 
aren't much a lot of them don't trade they're just trying to figure out something to sell okay now Elliott wave is um, I'm gonna go to a different chart here and I'm gonna pull this back and get just kind of some open space Elliott wave what he identified is that the market moves and in waves that really you know and that's no no magic there it's peak and valley patterns right peak and valley patterns and so what he what he identified is is when we finally start making a break and start moving higher we have a wave one up and there's a sub wave down a correction wave a corrective wave now he called them impulse waves and corrective waves and what he identified is that um, wave one and wave two was really the beginning okay this is where the stock started to break out and identify a trend kind of what I talk about every day right wave one and wave two was just the beginning of a move. Oh, awesome, Mary. I, by the way, anybody that has an opportunity to go to a TC2000 thing, you should do that. And if you get a chance, go up and pull on the shirt sleeve of Michael Thompson. Tell him you're with us. Um, talk with him a little bit. He is a great guy and has more knowledge about TC2000 than anybody I know. Okay. Take the time to do that. They, yeah, great people, really nice folks. Oh, that's awesome, Paul. Yeah, that's great. He really is an awesome guy. So, oh, he knows everything there is to know. <laughs> <laughs> about TC2000. If I have a question about TC2000, I want to talk to Michael because he can get me there quick. He knows everything there is to know. Um, so when you take a look at, at the wave pattern, there's wave one and wave two. Now what um, Elliott Way, or what Ralph, or uh, Elliott Wave Analysis, um, what he identified is that markets tend to move up in five waves and then there's the corrective waves in the pullback now the problem with Elliott wave is it's very very complex I mean honestly if you if you want to go through and get your CMT certified market technician status um, it's um, Elliott wave is like a three-month course and I will tell you this that you put a whole bunch of Elliott waivers in the room and ask them what the wave count is and you're gonna get probably a different answer from every single one okay because it's so complex in in its entire structure but me being me and always wanting simple I I took this idea and simplified it and I'll and I'll be honest this really came from a guy by the name of David Elliott. Now, David didn't have anything to do with Elliott Wave, okay? He didn't have anything to do with it. It just happened that his name was, last name was Elliott. But he, he brought my attention to this, and it just made so much sense to make it simple um, rather than fighting all of the different wave counts and stuff in a chart. But here's here. Let me get finish up this theory part. Wave one, wave two, wave three. Wave three was considered the money wave. It was one of the bigger waves in the move. Okay, wave three was a money wave. It's where you wanted to be in the trade. Wave four, the corrective wave in the pullback, and then wave five could be. It usually is not, but can be as good or as strong as wave three okay so what what Elliott waivers are always trying to do is they're always looking for wave three 
wave five in an up moves. That's where they want to get into the trades. Okay? So pretty simple pattern. Well, David Elliott looked at a chart in a different way. He was he was really a, a quite a quite a guy. Um, he he had a unique way of looking at everything. Um, and if you look at a, a chart like AMD, he identified right away that if we could identify if we could take a look at a chart, we could really wrap the whole Elliott wave thing around any moving average, anything at all. Okay, and take an and and use that to our advantage. So he would do this, and I've kind of taken that a lot further, I guess, in what he originally talked about. Wave one, cross over the 50-day moving average. Wave two, pull back to hold it as support. There's the money wave right there. Wave three. Now notice you can use the same thing on any moving average. Wave one, cross over the eight exponential moving average. That's that black line. Wave two, the pull back to catch it, hold it as support. Wave three, there's your money wave. And if you identify these patterns, by the way, um, down moves are the same thing. Uh, break down from a moving average, rally back, you have resistance in the trade, and wave the wave uh, three down then occurs in the chart. So by following that pattern, and we can look through charts and use just about anything that we want, we can start to identify some of these simple wave patterns in the chart and make it um, useful to us in our trading. And you can use any moving average that you want, any chart that you want, anything that you want to find in the trade. So one of the great things about the round of bottom breakout is we're always looking for that wave one. Wave two is this corrective or consolidating move. We're looking for wave three, the money wave in this move. The breakdown here, wave one, wave two, wave three. And that wave three really carried out a long time, actually, depending on how you traded it. So just very simple. And by the way, you can use the same moves. You can use it around a 200 day. You can use it around a 34 EMA. You can use it around an eight exponential. You can use it around anything that you want to use. Okay. It's a fantastic little tool to be able to identify those impulse waves and that opportunity to make profits in a trade. Okay, so when we use the 3-8 trap strategy, if you guys remember, what I'm always trying to identify in the trade is when we don't wanna chase the crossover in any trade. Okay, we don't want to chase crossovers. The crossover is where the problems occur, where we can reverse and come right back down. This isn't a very good example. Let's go to like AMD. We don't want to chase the crossover. We want to look for the hold of support. Okay, so we get that crossover move in here. We get these holds of support, and notice that's where those 3 8 trap trades come into play. So we're looking for those wave moves without trying to chase the crossovers. The crossover is where we can get the reversal failures that occur, okay? And if you look at most of the charts, uh, charts that we trade and things like that that you'll see um, all over the place, you can identify those wave counts after the crossover. And it's really simple to do. And if we just follow those patterns over and over and over, wait for the lower risk entries. And by the way, it's the wave two move that creates the low risk entry. So the wave one crossover always keeps us pretty far away from our stop loss. The wave two pullback 
moves us closer to our stop loss. And if this happens to consolidate or do more of a J hook pattern, that volatility stop starts moving up and gets closer and closer under here. And we're looking for that buy right in here. That's where we get the low risk entries. Okay. Into a trade. Okay, so that is essentially the Elliott wave simplified to work in our strategy here, our 3.8 strategy. We always want to try and catch that stock after that crossover move, wait for the pullback, and then we get that low risk entry here. Here, we have a high risk in the trade. Here, we have a low risk in the trade. Wave one, wave two, wave three. Does that make sense? And those wave patterns continue to repeat themselves over and over and over with that shorter term strategy. Okay. Now, TC2000, uh, Barry, you asked the question, TC2000 has an indicator. It's an Elliott wave indicator. So I'm gonna move this down and move up the Elliott Wave oscillator. The Elliott Wave oscillator, let's open this up so you can see the settings in here. They don't give you any, any settings in here on the oscillator. Okay, you don't get to choose um, what it is set around. Let me, give me just a second. Um, I'll give you the exact numbers here. Let's see, I'm looking forward here. Uh, thank you, thank you, Randy, 554. So it's it's a 5 EMA and a, a 34, um, or excuse me, SMA, um, that is creating this oscillator. They don't give you any advantage to adjust that. There is software out there that you can adjust the Elliott Wave oscillator for that. And you can see what I've done is, any it's it's set up as a histogram and i've set this up as you know blue and kind of yucky yellow just so i can distinguish it against a, um, a balance of power or something like that but what it's showing us is that wave oscillation so during this period anything below zero is we're negative in this in this trade. Here's where we begin the Elliott wave crossover. So we've done this move where we've waved one, wave two, we're holding support and we're starting to get that wave three up. And this is trying to incorporate all the waves into the oscillator. Okay, so you can see those bullish periods in the stock. If we, if we look at something like AMD, you can see we switched over and became bullish in here in the chart. So we took that downtrend away, wave one, wave two, and we became bullish in the trade. Does that make sense, guys? And that's all it's doing is it's hope it's it's telling us that our that we have trend that something is going on here in the trend. If you need something to help you confirm when we have that positive trend in place, that oscillator might be helpful to you in identifying that trend. Just as if we look at that TSV indicator, um, that TSV indicator um, can show us, or balance of power can show us when we have those opportunities to uh, take advantage of trend okay it's just giving us those clues 
So you can utilize that Elliott wave that way in the chart. I kind of prefer myself I because I don't like to clutter my chart with too much stuff. I'm going to be more inclined to just pay attention to the chart pattern itself. And I can do a very simple count of a of a wave or a move or a trend in a chart. It's not easy, not hard to do. Wave one, wave two, there's wave three, wave four, wave five. Right? It's not hard to do. We don't chase the crossover, we wait for the pullbacks. And if we pay attention to that, we have those opportunities for good quality trades, even in a stock like Tesla that I would never probably trade. Break the downtrend, wave one, wave two to hold support, wave three. If we look at downtrends in a move, you can see that those downtrends work just the same. We look for those crossover moves, wait for the rally back. I always, I always, um, start my wave count when it crosses over um, be like I said it can cross over any moving average you can cross over the 50 day moving average you can cross over a 200 you can cross over a, a 34 you can whatever you can cross you can start your wave count here so using our 3 a trap strategy we, we never trade we don't want to chase the crossover so there's wave one crossing over the indicators Wave two is the pullback to find support. Now, we wouldn't have caught a trade here. This was a gap on earnings. Okay, but there's your wave two. Wave three, beautiful, easy, 3A trap trade for wave five. Okay, so as you go through, go through charts and you look at those crossing patterns, that's where your wave count begins and you start to move through that chart and look for those productive trades that can set up. So it's really, really simple. Um, the problem with the true Elliott wave analysis is it's very, very complex. And like I said, you can get a whole bunch of people and they'll just disagree on what the wave count is. But for me, any, any of us in here, we could look and say, that's wave one crossing down, wave two finding resistance, wave three down. There's our money wave. Wave three, there's wave four, and there's wave five. Cross back over, there's wave one up, wave two back, wave three up. Wave four pull back, wave five. Okay, so we can, we can go through that just by using the crossover of any average or any indicator that you want. Okay, so with some of this information, guys, do you think this will help you in maybe identifying when institutions are, are moving in and out of a stock where you can identify some of those volume profiles and some of that um, um, accumulation distribution into those stocks and then take advantage of the price action moves that give us clues and give us confidence in the trade. Okay, please remember and always remember this, no matter how many indicators you use, the most important thing will always be price. It's interesting when we put an indicator on a chart, how many would agree to this? You put an indicator on a chart, and what do your eyes immediately get drawn to? They get drawn to the indicator, right? We forget to look at price. So we have to focus on price first. Okay? We have to find price first. And if we look for that, carefully carefully inspect and look at these charts, we can see that indicators can provide us confirmation. It can give us that warm and fuzzy that what we're doing is seeing price correctly. But it will always be the price action that creates 
the signal to buy or sell. Okay? Always be price that creates the signal to buy or sell. So I hope you guys got something out of this today. Jeez, uh, I went an hour and a half, well, almost an hour and 40 minutes so far. Thank you guys um, for being here. I truly appreciate it. And hopefully you picked up a little bit of information here. Um, why markets move the way they move. It's, it's not retail traders. It's the big money. It's the institutions. Right? It's the big money that's moving the market. And if we can identify it, we can take advantage of that. And all we have to do is just hitch a ride. We don't have to predict anything. Just hitch a ride. And we take advantage of their movement in the stock. That's right. Just get on the train. Thanks, guys. I appreciate you very much for being here. Everyone take care of yourselves. Have an awesome, awesome weekend. Wish you all the best. We'll see you bright and early Monday morning. Thanks, guys.